Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Welcome to everybody who can't be with us tonight. We're glad that you joined us uh, from the comfort of your living room or the couch of your camper or any place else you may be. We're glad you're with us. And uh, if we could turn it around, everybody could say hi. But if we did it, they couldn't see you anyway. But uh, we're glad you're with us. And I'm going to ask you now to let's just all bow our heads and let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so thankful that we can be in your house. We're thankful for your gracious mercy, your love that just covers our lives. Father God, I know that you never cease to walk beside us. You never cease to protect us and keep us safe and, and to in, help us to endure the things that come against us. Lord, you never put on us more than we can overcome. And Father, I just I pray that you will help me and you will help each one in this church for us to have a greater appreciation, a greater love, and a greater desire to seek you above all things in our lives. And Father, when we do that, I know everything that we will ever have need or want will be added unto us. Father, I thank you tonight that we have time to study together. And Lord, I pray that you will bless this time and that you will just open our eyes and hearts to receive from your word. Lord, I thank you for a wonderful meal. And I thank you for those that prepared it and blessed us with it. And Lord, I just pray that you will continue to guide and direct us as we seek you. And these things we humbly ask in your name. And every one of us said, Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to talk about <clears throat> kind of a precursor. I know we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, but the Lord just laid something on my heart today that, that I really uh, feel that needs to kind of be a precursor going into Sunday. I, I, it's not going to keep folks that don't hear it tonight from getting the message on Sunday. But I think for us as a, uh, you know, you've heard me say this before, this is kind of the, this is kind of the bedrock, the core, the foundation of your church is the ones that are able to make it on Wednesday. Uh, and and it's not the, that's not bad-mouthing anybody who don't or can't or whatever because there's many people who do and they have things that they go do and other things that they have to attend to. I get it. But usually you can look across your church and if we're running somewhere between 175 and 200 people, you're probably going to have 70, 75 on a Wednesday night. So that tells you about 100 to 125 people go missing. And for whatever reason. And it doesn't matter. I'm not getting in their business. That's, that's their business. But that kind of tells you your core group because they want to continue to be fed. They want to continue to dig deeper. And they want to continue to, to meet with God's people. And so... That being said, I want to give you the basis of this. So we're going to begin in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm going to deal with something that the church has been called to since the inception of the church. As a matter of fact, it's written, uh, all these New Testament churches, it is written right here in the first letter to the church of Thessalonica. And in chapter 5 and verse 17, it's a very short piece of scripture. Pray without ceasing. That means a constant mode of prayer. Now, I know you go, I go to a job every day. So if I go to a job every day, do I walk around like this, Brother Joe, with one eye cracked open and I'm praying? No. You stay in a mode of prayer. An attitude of prayer. You know, uh, my old pastor used to say, your attitude determines your altitude. And, and so, I believe in that a great deal. There's only a few things in life that you can control. You can't control. You get behind the wheel of a car, but it goes, I, got, I like to have control of my car. Well, you really don't have control of it. Because at 85 miles an hour, you have a blowout. You'll understand, I no longer control anything. Or you have a truck blow by you uh, that just happens to catch you in the right kind of rainy conditions and you begin to hydroplane, you'll find I have no control over anything. Uh, many of us, uh, we try to avoid things that we don't feel like we can control. Well, if we're going to do that, we're going to sit at home and stay in and stay out of life because honestly, we don't control anything but our attitude. How we accept things, how we go about things, how we walk through things, those are our attitude. Those are things that we can control. 
uh, your desire to, to get up and do something. You control that. Uh, get up and do something. You can control that. And so there's a few things you can control. But the average American absolutely does everything in their power not to control the things they can control. They want to control the things they have no control over. That's the truth. And so in order for us to control the things that we can control, we must maintain an attitude of prayer. That must surround us constantly throughout the day. And you say, well, why is that? Well, for example, somebody walks in your office and chews your tail out. Well, the first thing you want to do is bow your chest and tuck your neck and get a little stiff and come right back at them. But grace has to take over. And for grace to take over, you have to be in a constant state of prayer. Because that's the only thing that will soften your heart and allow grace to take over in that moment. That's why he says, pray without ceasing. And when you do go into prayer, pray until you're done. You know, some people just throw up a few words and, and, and pray until you're done. And you'll know when you're done. That's the most interesting thing I've found about prayer. I get down on my knees, I start to pray. I'll get up, I'll start walking, I'll pray. I pray walking back and forth across here some and across there some. And, and, but you know when you're done. It's almost like God releases you. Okay, you're done. Run along now. You've told me all you need, and I got it. So, but that doesn't mean that I go to my office and I never think about praying again. Because there's going to be moments. I get a text. Hey, would you please pray for my brother? Please pray for my sister. Please pray for... Now, I don't want to have to go, okay, Lord, forgive me if there's any sin in my life. I'm fixing to pray for this brother. No, I want to maintain that attitude of prayer. So I want to immediately be able to go, hey, Father God, I don't know what the problem is. I don't know the issue. It's not important because you know it. And so, Father, I just bring this person before you right now that you will minister to them. You'll touch their lives. That's all I have to do. But I'm in a constant attitude of prayer so I can immediately pray. You ever walked up to somebody and said, hey, I need you to pray with me? And they don't go, well, I'll tell you what. Let me catch up with you in about a half an hour and I'll pray with you. Most of them will just grab you and go, let's pray right now. Hell, let me help you out. Let's go. And they'll pray with you. They'll hug you up. They'll pray with you. They'll grab your hands, whatever they need to do. And that's because they can maintain a constant attitude of prayer, praying without ceasing. All right. Luke chapter 19. I'm going to be dealing with verses 45 and 46. It says, And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. That's pretty simple. The Jewish businessmen were gathered and they were selling and, and in most cases uh, doing it unfairly to the public, taking advantage of the public. And he was already upset and irritated over the fact that this is a house that is to be gathered in for prayer. But now you're going to come in here and cheat people. You're not just going to do honest business. You're going to cheat people in my father's house. We're not going to do that. And that's why he angers. And then he told them what? This is a house of prayer. You've turned it into something completely different, a den of thieves. So right there we understand, as Jesus spoke, we understand what the house of God is supposed to be. It's a house of prayer. We've turned it into a house of all sorts of things, but it's a house of prayer. We've turned it into a house of concerts. We've turned it into, I got nothing. Let me just precursor this before I get started. I got nothing against music. I love good gospel music. 
I love all sorts of gospel music. I even like some of the uh, rap gospel music. Not much of it, but I even like some of it. I, I like some of the young people stuff. I like some of the, the older stuff of the church. I like quartets. I, I like all kinds of gospel music. I like country gospel. You don't find as much of it anymore, but I like it. But we've turned the Lord's house into a concert hall. Now, you go, now wait a minute, Brother Joe. That's, that's praise and worship. I got no problem with that when it's praise and worship. But let's me and you be honest. Where does praise and worship stop? And where does the ministry stop? When does it, there's a fine line between it crossing over to entertainment. Let's just be honest. There's a fine line where it crosses over. I'm fixing to step on some toes, I know it. But that's why I'm very careful about the music that comes into the church from the outside. I can tell you right now, for those of you who have never seen the Alvarado, have anybody here ever seen Alvarado Roadshow? You have? I'm going to be honest with you. They're not on the surface. They won't seem Christian to you. They won't because they sing a country, a very country style of music. Because when I listened to their music, I went, And if you listen to the lyrics, you can pick it up. But if you don't, you get caught up in that twang. And, and so I asked the brother that called me, I said, hey, I need to know something. I said, I'm not picking up on the direct relation. To, I mean, if I listen closely, I can pick up what you're saying. You got a positive message in there. I get it. But you got to really listen for it. And he said, there's a reason for that. And I thought, I can't wait to hear this one. And he said, brother, we can go into a church house and we can sing gospel music all day long and we'll entertain the Christian people in that, in that congregation. That's what we'll do. He said, or we can sing this style of music which will get the attention of those that aren't necessarily Christian people in your congregation and it will minister through the words to their heart. And he said, I promise you, the words of those songs through the power of the Holy Spirit will break their hearts. Enough said, I'm in. <laughs> because you know your message. You know what you set out to do. And if you're telling me that, that means you spend time in prayer asking the Holy Spirit through those lyrics to touch the hearts of people. That's what I want to know. I want to know the heart of the men that are standing up here delivering that music. That's why, that's why I feel comfortable having Brandon here. I know the hearts of those men that stand up here and deliver that music. And so that being said, what else do we do? Well, we tend to turn it into a, a place of fellowship. Nothing wrong with that, right? Nope. But there's again the fine line where we know where fellowship and outreach no longer are together. You know, most of your fellowships... You want to do something with them. What's the goal? What's the goal of the church? It's to minister to people. So your fellowship should have some touch of outreach to them. Your music should have some form of outreach to it. Everything you do should have some piece of outreach to it. Why is that? So that you can do the mission of the church and that's to touch the hearts and lives of people that don't know Jesus. Let's be honest. Most everybody that comes into the congregation, not everybody, but I would say at least 70% of the church has some type of relationship with Jesus Christ that comes to church on Sundays or Wednesdays. Very few sinners just wander in here. Usually somebody brings them knowing full well they got a chance, they got a shot. But if we constantly are just fellowshipping so that we can enjoy and have fun, we'll never minister to those folks. And so... God's house is multifaceted. And that's why I say all the time, He needs every one of you and I to work together to do everything that He wants to do to touch the hearts and lives of people. 
Because I can't, I can't minister to everybody. Some people will never even see or hear or know the gospel from me. But Craig might in Sunday school, or Mike might, or or Mary Jo, or any of the lady Sunday school teachers, or Martha and Mickey down there. Or, they may, they may touch the heart of life of a young person that touches the heart and life of their whole family. So this thing, this is exponentially growing to touch the hearts and lives of people. Folks, we've been on a growth spurt. Many of you haven't realized this because you sit within the first 10 rows of the church and you don't see anything behind you until it's over. But we've been on a growth spurt over about the last month. We've kind of watched it. 125, 130, 150, you know, then all of a sudden it was 150 for just a little bit, and then 170, 170, 175, 180, 210, or 201 rather, and then back to like 180, 190. We're, we're now getting up there boarding in that 175 to probably 2, 205 range. We're steadily growing. Why? Because Christ will grow what we have invested in Him. Amen. If we don't invest it in Him, we're done. We're washed up. Everything, this church is not about my vision. It's not about your vision. It's not about my project. It's not about your project. It's literally about what does God want to touch and minister to the lives of people in the reach of this, this community and this church. And when we focus on that, and that becomes our sole focus, I, I, don't, I don't care if the chairs are brown, purple, pink, or green. I don't care if this screen works and that screen doesn't. If we got one, we're doing good. What I care about is are we delivering the message of Jesus Christ? I would rather see it Forget about that. I, I, I'd rather see a church full of people that is excited about people coming in our back door and we're loving on them and we're welcoming them and, and, and we're proud to see them and we're serving them and we're running, you know, we're, we're running to them and to love on them and show them the love of Christ. I'd rather see that than people running around like chickens with their heads cut off to get a screen working. If it works, it works. If it don't, guess what? That's what Monday's for. We'll call the technician and we'll get it fixed. But show that should not become our focus. Any more than anything else in the church, we shouldn't focus on if somebody spills something on a chair, hey, get some towels, clean it up, get back to business. It's, it's, it's literally about what does Jesus want in His church and from His people? And when we start accomplishing that because that's our laser focus, then and only then will we accomplish what Jesus has set forth for this church. And I can tell you right now, He has shown it to me. I've seen it. It's great things. It, it, it is exponentially great. I may not live to see it. He showed me so much of a vision. I may not live to see it. It would be nice. But I can tell you what I don't want to be. I don't want to be Moses. Live to see it and never accomplish it. And I'm just serving notice here. I will battle you over that because I've watched, Mo I've watched Moses' example. And he did everything he thought he could do, but he was wrapped in with a bunch of folks that got punished. And, and I don't want any of you to get punished. I want us to be laser focused on what God has given to us, what He's called us to do. He gave us 18 acres. He didn't give us 18 acres to mow. I'm going to be honest with you. He didn't give you 18 acres to mow. And He didn't give you 18 acres so that you'd go out there and shred, hit a rock, start it all on fire and burn everything down. He didn't give it to you for that. He gave it to you to put buildings and put arenas and put things on so that you can further your reach and further your reach for the gospel. And that's what we need to think about and get laser focused on. Oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm getting wrapped up here. <clears throat> First Timothy 2.
I don't know about the rest of y'all in them blankets, but whew, I've worked myself into a sweat up here. That's all right. Hun, I don't need it. <laughs> I promise you that. All right. First Timothy chapter 2. And I'm going to be dealing with verses 1 through 4 and then verse 8. It says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Church, we should pray for, intercede on behalf of, thanks, give thanks for, and, 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 and supplications on behalf of people. All throughout our church, our community, that should be one of the things that drives us. But this, for kings and all who are in high positions, that they may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Pray for your leadership. He told us to pray for all. Then he said, pray for your leadership so that they will live in peace and godly. And then again for all so that everybody can come to know Jesus Christ. Because He would that all would be saved. Now I know some of us go, ah, yeah, that's a lost cause. No, it's lost in your mind. Because Jesus don't give up until it's over. People all the time, and I've heard this a million times, and the best words I've ever heard given back for it was, you know, why does God always take good people home? And He leaves. Why don't He just clean out a prison? We are overcrowded anyway. Just clean it out. Why don't He do that? They still need a chance. But if your loved one knows Jesus Christ, they're ready. They're ready. They're graduating. They're, they're doing good. Don't hold me back. I'm going home. Honestly. But he would that some of the rest of these still have a chance. And our job is to capitalize on that. That's why there's prison ministries. That's why there's prayer chains. That's, you know what? The prayer chain in the church is really for more than so you know. It's not an information line. It's a prayer chain. But churches today, if you're not careful, it becomes an information line. But I want people on the other end of that that I know are praying. Not just informed. And you go, well now, Brother John, I think that's a little... That's a little preconceived idea there, maybe. Uh, maybe you're judging a little bit. Maybe. But I've seen it. And I've seen it where it's been in action, where people actually use it for the right things. And I'm going to be honest with you. If it's used properly, that's one of the strongest and greatest things ever. But I, I, you know, I've met people who want access to a prayer chain that I'm hard pressed to wonder if they pray for themselves because they're always in their own turmoil. And if you're kind of constant state of prayer, you're not going to be in that kind of turmoil all the time. I'm not going to say you're not going to walk through a trial. Everybody does. But even when in the midst of a trial, now we're going to have a little fun. Lynn and I get to discuss this every once in a while. I have never been a big Joel Osteen fan. Just, just haven't been. Wasn't my favorite guy in the world because he was just always too doggone happy. Life can't be that good all the time at your house only. I mean, I'm a preacher and it ain't like that for me. Come on, Joel. And, and the Lord says we're going to go through trials. Don't keep telling everybody that we're going to be peace, love, joy, and happy. But what you have to understand from Joel is he tried when he first took over that church behind his father who was a powerful man of God. 
preached hell fire and brimstone and I mean preached the gifts of the spirit uh, tongues prophecy the whole nine yards the gifts of healing and he did this worldwide and it grew that church Joel tried to come in behind dad and be dad resurrected and it didn't work for Joel all the church didn't hurt because God knew his heart was in the right place. But Joel was hurting because this ain't working for me. I can't be my dad. And it wasn't until I read one of his books where he said, I had to come to the understanding that the Lord was calling me to do something different. In a world in which I live today, there is very little good, peace, love, and joy. And so Jesus called me to spread peace, love, kindness, and joy because people get beat up all week. When they come into the house of the Lord, they need to know that the Lord is about peace, love, kindness, gentleness, joy, compassion. They need to see that. They need, they need me to point it out in the Scripture where it's at. They need, they need to see it in the lives of men and women who are already in the Bible. And they need to see that, that, that being poured out in their lives. And when I read that, I got a whole different appreciation for that man. That's kind of one of those, the, your preacher went judging before he went li listening. And, and, and so, I now understand why he preaches what he preaches. And this is what I will tell you. I agree with him. We have enough negativity we have enough people kicking each other, beating each other, taking it on the chin. You're working uh, six days a week, sometimes seven, all hours of the night, trying to make it, trying to get, trying to make the corporate world, trying to get up the ladder there, so or just trying to make a living. And you get beat up there if you do this right or you do that wrong. And, and it's constant. If you're doing good, they want more out of you. If you're doing bad, they're kicking you and then asking for more. In any case. You have enough. So what you need is you need to come into the safety of your church and expect to be loved on, lifted up, ministered to. You know what? When you went... Eh, this is a different generation here. <laughs> we're going to try it. When you were a kid and you did something foolish on your bicycle or in a tree or whatever... And you got skin up, tore something up, cut something, whatever it might be, and you went in to your mom. How many of you met compassion? See, I told you this would be the wrong ear. <laughs> but you met somebody who was willing to doctor it, clean it, help you get through to the other side of it. Uh, they usually put uh, some kind of... Uh, Usually they would, uh, my grandma always cleaned it with soap and water. Hey, nothing better than soap and water, son. And then after we, after we did that, then she put this same stuff on it, monkey blood. We, kids go to church, their knees was orange if they had shorts on, you know. And so, uh, on your head. <laughs> But when you come into the house of the Lord, you kind of expect somebody to love on you and wash your wounds and put something on them. I prefer old black salve. That's what my grandmother finally started using. She put old black salve on everything. I mean, she put that on everything. I mean, we even greased the door hinges with it. That good stuff, man, I'm telling you. And so, you know, but it didn't burn like monkey blood or alcohol. Now, my mom wasn't near as compassionate as my grandmother was. My mom would just pour alcohol on it. Here you go. Have some of that. You won't do that foolishness again, will you? you know, just the way she was. You know, She was kind like that. So, <laughs> one quick story. How many of you remember the days of Evil Knievel and jumping ramps and doing all that? Yeah. <clears throat> Not being a real smart kid, but being adventurous. I took one of my dad's concrete two by sixes 
and I put it on the chain link fence. And I thought, I'll get me a running start and I'll jump off this four foot chain link fence. <laughs> well, how many of you know those bars on top aren't steel? <laughs> However, I didn't get that far. Because Evil Knievel always rode up on his ramp and then put his feet down and it took a look at what he was fixing to jump over. I got up to the top of it and put my feet off the pedals and guess what? There was no tuba six there. It was under my wheels. I had no place to go but down. And I caught that chain link fence up this side, right under this arm, and it had those spikes on it at the top. So I took all the hide from here all the way to my elbow. And I went in the house like this, and my mom said, step over in the bathtub. And I did. Hold your arm up. And she just poured alcohol from my elbow. I never attempted another jump again. <laughs> I even thought about jumping over puddles. Do I really want to do this? <laughs> so if you want to break your children from doing silly things, just douse them in alcohol. I, I, it doesn't work. It didn't work for her neither. And I want to move down in, in verse 8. It says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. In every place men should pray, lifting holy hands without quarreling. No battle, no fight. When I'm in a state of prayer, I'm not in any mood to wrestle with you, fight with you, quarrel with you, or anything else. Because I'm in a state of prayer. I'm standing before the Lord. I'm in His presence. And if I'm in His presence, you're, you're not going to bother me. You're not going to bug me. You're not going to get to me. I have one last scripture. James chapter 5. James chapter 5, and I'm going to be dealing with verses 13 through 18. And y'all have heard this a million times. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of our Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of... Now, I learned this a different way, but I'm going to say it the way it's written here. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much is the way I learned it. But, so I always remember it that way. But it has great power. The prayers of a... What kind of man? A righteous man. Somebody who is right standing with God. Not somebody who goes to church. Let me, let me clear this up. Not somebody who goes to church. Not somebody who even teaches a Sunday school class. Not somebody who, who wrote a book about prayer. Not a televangelist or anybody else. They could be. But it says what? It says the prayers of a righteous man. You don't have to be righteous to do any one of them things I just mentioned. I know, it's sad. But there's a lot of that in the world today. And so I'm just telling you, choose your prayer partners. You, shouldn't have, you should not have to look around the church, to find your prayer partners. They should be readily available. You should be, you should be able to walk up to anybody. But I'm telling you, you know, until we all get there, you're going to have to choose your prayer partners wisely. You're going to have to know they're ready to go before the Lord. Let's go. Hey, we got some kingdom business to take care of. Gather around. And I don't know if you know this or not, and I'm going to close with this. Anytime you spend time with a brother or sister in prayer, you are taking care of kingdom business. 
Because that's what it's about. If somebody walks up to you and says, hey, Brother Joe, would you please pray with me? I'm not going to pray with you when we get around to it. I'm going to pray with you right there. Because why? Because right now you need something from God. And I need to do kingdom business. That's the bottom line. I, you don't need me to pray for you when I get around to it. You need me to pray for you right then. And I'm learning to pray for people over the phone. I, I've never been real good at that because I just feel kind of callous. But, but it's not about how I feel. It's about what's going on. I, I just, I, you know, I, I, I didn't get a hold of him tonight. I tried. I left him a message. But uh, Miss Lynn uh, seen the same posting that I did. She said, hey, can I, I was coming in here for prayer. She said, can I reply to this for you? And I said, yes, just tell him that I will try to get a hold of him. This is a gentleman who was in a really bad, horrific car accident. Both he and his wife. And they've tried to get at least three pastors to come and visit. And, and I, I told them the honest truth. I don't know if they're in the hospital. I don't know if they're home. I don't know where they are. But I don't feel like with a wedding in a week, I can go into a hospital right now and visit. I, I got a job to do next Saturday, you know, honestly, not our Saturday week. And, and so I want to be prepared for that. But I can pray for you. I can call you and pray for you. I can, And when I get on the other side of that, if you're still in need, I'll come see you then. I just... There's some things in my personal life I've got to take care of too. And so, but I tried to call tonight and, and told him, I said, hey, look, I know you've had trouble with the pastors. I'm not putting you off. I just, I've got to go into the service and I haven't been able to get you. So I will try you back either later tonight or I'll try you back tomorrow evening. I said, I've got a, I've got a counseling on Zoom at this time and I'll try to call you later. And so, I don't want to be the fourth pastor. That's scary, isn't it? I mean, these people are in, they're in a, they're in a pretty bad place. And nobody. I don't know them by name. I don't. I know the lady who asked me, but I don't know them. But it doesn't matter. I don't know what they have need of. I know one thing they need, and that's prayer. They need constant prayer. Because God's going to have to intervene in their life. Or they're going to be devastated for this for the rest of the days of their life. Church, that's us. That's what we're called to do. I had to think about that long and hard, but that's what we're called to do. We're not called to put that off to the next pastor. We're not called to put that off to somebody else. You do what you can do. You may not be able to do it all, but you can do something. And you establish a relationship. And because you establish a relationship, you'll always have an opportunity to minister. You'll always have an opportunity to put into somebody's life. See, that's the problem today. We don't have time to stop and build relationships because we're too busy building our own life. Hear me, church. We get so wrapped up and self-consumed in building us and building our life and building what we want and how we want it that we can't stop long enough to build relationships with people that are broken, hurting, and in need. And then everybody goes, I can't understand why people don't want to come to the church. I'll give you a clue. The church don't have time for them. They come broken. They come hurt. They come in need. They come desperate. And the church goes, about their business. Talking in this group over here and that group over here and, and never will they know what's going on in that family's life. And that family can become a part at the seams. And you go, well, Brother Joe, how are we supposed to know that? Investment. You make an investment in their life just by stopping to visit with them, talk with them, hug a neck, high five a kid, whatever the case may be. The church has to start investing in people. Ooh, this is getting deep. If you, if you need to, go ahead and bend over, pull your pant leg up, and stick them inside your socks. Church, I'm telling you now, we have to make an investment in people. I believe with all my heart, God's calling us to a building over there and an arena down there. 
But long before you get either one of those finished and built, I'm going to tell you what he's going to see of us. That's an investment in people. When he sees us starting to invest in people, then he's going to open the gates and say, let's build. Because right now, we still got to grow into it. Because I'm going to tell you, he's going to send a whole bevy of people with an arena down there and a whole bevy of people with basketball, volleyball, or even a banquet facility over here. He's going to send a whole different group of people there. And if this church is not ready to deal with them people and make a sound investment in their lives, He's not going to give us those things. I don't care how much money we raise and put in this church. We can build it and it will be unsuccessful and it will sit there idle until we learn how to make an investment and love people. I can promise you that much. And so I'm calling you, church. Ask God to teach you how to invest in people. God, what do I have to do to invest in people? I, I, I can't speak for the ladies' group. I don't go. <laughs> wonder why. But I can speak for the men's group. And Ben Daniel is pouring his heart out into the men that will come to teach them discipleship so that they can disciple the hearts and lives of other people as they come into this church. And so he's built a foundation and we're probably going to build a foundation at least for another month. And then we're going to dive into the lesson hard and fast. So you're not behind yet. So come on. Guys, that's a great place for you to take time with other men and learn how to invest in people that will be coming to this church and, and, and how to make a difference in their lives. And you start that by what? Standing elbow to elbow, arm in arm and going, hey, we got your back. That's what it's truly all about. And all of that revolves around what? A posture of prayer. Can't get there from here without prayer. And so we have to learn how to pray. We have to be diligent in it. And I know a lot of people go, well, you know, Pastor, I got to get up early in the morning and I got to go to work and I got to do this and I got all I got to get all my kids ready for school. I'm fixing to make some people mad. Get everything ready the night before. Instead of watching television or whatever you're doing, get everything ready the night before. Well, you don't know. You don't have kids. I had kids, but I was gone before they went to school. <laughs> so you'd have to talk to their mother about that. But get the stuff ready and have everything in place so that you can spend time in prayer. Or, guess what? Once everybody goes to bed, take the time of prayer in the evening. God didn't say, I only listen between 6 and 8 in the morning. He said, no, you make an appointment with me and meet with me routinely. Make your appointment with God and say, okay, at 6 o'clock every morning, I'm going to meet with Him for an hour. And it's just going to be me, Him, and the Bible, or the Word. Or, and it may be 30 minutes, it may be. But set that appointment and make it. Because I promise you this. If you had a devastating disease and your doctor sets you an appointment at 5.30 a.m. every morning at Scott and White, you'd be there at 5.20 waiting on your appointment because you're devastated. And I'm going to tell you something. You try living without Jesus very long and you'll be devastated. So make that appointment. Any questions, any comments tonight? Yes, ma'am. If anybody don't think they're going to get enough of them, they will be at uh, Jackie Cox's church in Temple on Saturday night. They'll be here on Sunday morning. And so, and Jackie said, you're certainly welcome to come over there and, and take part with their church. They're having a celebration. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Wrap it up. I'll be with you in a minute. <laughs> Gotta love it. Anyone else? 
All right, church, stand with me tonight. Again, thank you to all that are here. Thank you for your time. I want to say thank you to all who cooked and those that cleaned, and, and I certainly appreciate it. And uh, I know we're standing, and we haven't done prayer requests, but we're going to do them. So uh, goodbye to everybody that's watching this on YouTube, and uh, we love you, and we'll see you Sunday, hopefully.